Welcome once again to the Lean Into Art Cast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together, take on a challenging topic, look at it from every conceivable angle, walk away with a few healthy tips, and uh, basically we like to think hard about storytelling, so you will too. My name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. That other guy over there is... I am Rob Stenzinger, in love with that phrase that Jersey made up to describe our podcast. And uh, I do uh, user experience design, UI engineering, game design, stuff like that. And uh, speaking of visual storytelling, Rob, we've got we've got a really exciting guest this week to talk about visual storytelling with us. Somebody who I've been a long time admirer of. Someone who I am uh, oh do I want to say the word honored? I'll say the word honored. I'm honored that I actually got to work with this guy on something. We got Dan Michigan on the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super excited for our guest, Dan. Welcome, Dan. Say it again, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. <clears throat> Uh, it's good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Just talk like a Muppet the entire time if you could, Dan. We would appreciate that. That's part of the flavor of our show. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's... Well, I uh, could do it like this anytime you want. But Dan Mishkin, let me, let me give him his, his, his proper introduction. Dan Mishkin, uh, comic book writer. Uh, wrote for Marvel, or no, DC. I almost said Marvel and DC. Did you write for Marvel, Dan? One or two or three stories, yeah. Okay. So, But you you were uh, most known for, uh, okay. well, yeah. historically known for uh, co-creating the character Blue Devil for DC Comics, uh, the series Amethyst Princess of Gemworld, which mm -hmm. is a series that, oh, Rob's holding it up. I can put it up on the screen so we can actually see it. A yeah. comic that... Um, Ooh, cool. I have gone on record many times to say, like, if you care about this medium, you should read this miniseries because it is, uh, it's, it's a stellar example of what comics can do. Uh, which, you, which you worked on with uh, co-creator Gary Cohn and Ernie Colon, who's going to figure into our conversation today. Uh, you wrote Superman, yeah. Wonder Woman. Uh, you wrote some other comics. You wrote for Dungeons, Dungeons and Dragons comics. You wrote a comic called Spell Game. Uh, creeps. You wrote also prose. You wrote the Forest King for what was Forest? What was the company that pr published Forest King? It's uh, Actionopolis. Actionopolis. That's right. Shannon Denton's uh, company a few years back. Shannon Denton and Patrick Coyle. Yeah. And then most recently, coming out this September, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this today, and, and Lean Into Art listeners will no doubt recognize this. I've talked about it before. Uh, the Warren Commission report, a graphic investigation into the Kennedy assassination, which you worked on, uh, you wrote, and uh, Ernie Colon and I did the art on. Uh, published by Abrams Comic yes. Arts, again, September 16th, I think, comes out. That is correct. So you've been around the block a couple times. You, you spent a <laughs> lot of years thinking about visual storytelling. Is Dan still there? I'm, I'm, I lost your sound for a second. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was just I was I was saying that you 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 have your uh you have your medals. You you've done this for a while and you've thought really long and hard about this visual storytelling stuff, and that's why I'm excited to have you there here. Yeah, well, no, it's very exciting. Although the introduction that talked about how a writer basically is going to talk to artists about visual storytelling is a little daunting. I like to think that I can communicate with artists about that stuff, but People don't want to see me draw comic books. Let's just say that. But see, this is the funny thing, and I hope is this is the case we can we can make it in part of our discussion today. Is uh, you're a guy who th who writes very visually, and I've got examples yeah. that we can bring up later on in the show. But uh, you may not be able to commit those ideas to paper with drawings, but you can certainly commit very visual ideas with words. And as somebody who has worked with a handful of different writers, I can say I wish everybody thought as visually as Dan Mishkin does. So okay, this is going to be I'll a good that. one. I, I, All right. I will definitely take that. Okay. So, but we've got a system, Rob. How do we, how do we uh, get ourselves warmed up and girded for the dangerous topic? Well, since we don't want to pull anything, and we do like to think hard about this stuff, there's, that is a risk. Uh, we like to, to explore a curveball question, which, you know, we, we, we take a swing at that, and then uh, we go into our topic 10,000 feet up and uh, get on the ground and, and, and uh, 
the you know we frame up, essentially you could think of them as almost like theory and practice section sections but no one grades us on this precisely other than you know kind of feedback you guys give us so but but that's in general how we how we how we take tackle this but uh, I think what you're you're framing up Jersey is is that ever important curveball section which I'm yeah. feeling like I need to get warmed up. So, um, Dan, you? did you? Okay, so you know, we gave you a little bit of heads up about this. Yes. Either Rob can pitch the curveball at us, or I can pitch the curveball at you two, or Dan, if you've got one that you want to throw at us so that we can chew on for five, ten minutes before we uh, get into the topic. I, I've got one that's, in a sense, it's near and dear to me as a writer, and I'm kind of interested in an artist's perspective on. Uh, when do you know that it's time to stop? When do you know that it's time to give up on that that page? that concept, that approach, that story idea, that series idea, that um, I, you know, and I've had a lot of experience at the giving up on a series and I spend way too long before I realize that I'm hitting my head against the wall and not just the business wall, a creative wall. Uh, but I'm really interested to know how, a, uh, how an artist says it is it is time to stop taking this approach, you know, visually or, or whatever, as well as the other about a series or a story. Rob? Uh, well, I mean, let's see. I can take it from sort of the, the um, independent, self-published person's point of view, where um, for me, I, I, I was working on a very personal story that uh, the, the journey of working on the story... Uh, Art Gig Zoo, The Way of Sound, which I started in, what, February 2008 and, uh, you know, continued roughly for about three, four years and trickled off over that course, um, succeeded in, you know, compiling one a single volume that had, tells one story arc um, and have been, you know, you know th sort of com contemplating how to continue or not the story for quite some time now. Um, I think there's... there's, there's thing I faced is is looking at um, what sort of uh, what am I getting out of continuing continuing it. So if you are at a point of I mean, so you're framing, framing things telling, and have you conveyed some sort of um, complete enough experience through the through conveying a portion of the story, right? Because a lot of times if we talk about what happened during our day or an interesting uh, event in our lives, we don't tell the entire every moment since we were born to that point and then continue thereafter. A story is a frame inherently. And I, so I think like you may be at the boundaries of one frame which has then all of a sudden you're at this juncture where maybe there's an option. Do you jump to the next frame or not? And uh, for me, I needed to, um, I found my urges to try other things again um, strong enough where that was, for me, that, that, that informed setting it down. But I could easily, like you mentioned a couple of walls, like the, the business wall or a creative wall. And if those walls coincide with the, with the edge of a frame in a story, uh, those are, yeah, I, I think pretty compelling junctures. Uh, Jersey, what do you think? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. I don't know how to tell when some when I've seen something through to the point where it's I, it's time for me to let it go. Um, yeah. Usually, uh, I guess, and this is gonna this is where I'm gonna be a little bit. Um, perhaps the word I'm looking for is candid. I'm not sure, but. Uh, Often it's it's through emotionally how I'm reacting to the thing. Um, it, 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 does it seem dreary to me to have to go back to that thing? Have I lost all of my love for it? If I'm excited about it, and see this is not this isn't talking about running up against the business wall, um, because right. even if I'm running up against the business wall, if I'm excited about it, I'll keep pushing on it like 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 a like. A, a mindless, you know, animal just just bashing my head into the wall on it because I'm so excited <laughs> about it. But um, but it's when it's when I've lost my passion for it. It's when I'm not no longer excited about it, and the thought of having to go back and do it just fills me with dread. Um, which has happened with a couple things in the past. Yeah. Um, 
but but it's it's purely oh and I hate to say it because we just we led this whole ep- this whole episode of the show with this thought of like we think hard about stuff so that you will too and then I go eh, it's kind of a gut thing it's it's a gut thing where I I, I think about how what, what is my heart telling me about it as dumb as that sounds um so on a page on a page it'll be to the point where uh, usually it's exasperation. Like if I'm looking at a page, I'm like, I don't even know if this is good anymore. I really don't know. I, it, I'm looking at it, it just looks like a bunch of garbly gook lines now, and I'll go to bed, you know. Or if it's in the middle of the day, I'll walk away from it, and do something else that I got to do, and then I'll come back and try to look at it with fresh eyes after a couple hours or hopefully eight hours away from it. And if it if I look at it again and it excites me, then I know to keep going. But if I look at it again and go like, oh god, what is this? Then it's time to <laughs> Scrap it, start over, or see about fixing something on it. I, I don't know if that even comes close to being a reasonable answer. Well, I mean, I, I think I think there's not really a great answer to that because we're all. That's part of the reason I asked the question is because it's hard to answer. We're all conditioned to push, push it out. You know, give birth to the baby and and all of that, and we can't pull back. We can't. We either can't get the perspective, or, or we can't. You know, we can't see how ridiculous we look sometimes. You know, yeah. trying to do something over and over again. It's that old idea of the the definition definition of insanity being, uh, you know, doing the same thing the same way and expecting a different result. Uh, you know, it it can be it can be absolutely crazy. Um, I try to stop myself before I decide that I'm totally wrong that it was ever a good idea. <laughs> but sometimes that's as far as I go before I stop. Do, do you have, Dan, do you have any trusted friends who you can who will, can look at something that you did and give you a really straightforward, in-your-face, honest answer of, like, this is not... Like, if you were going for this, you did not get there. And, like, there's the, the trust is there that they can say that to you and you're not going to freak out and they're not going to freak out? You know, when it... Uh, my issue has pr- probably more at the stage of of the big picture of the story, not the execution. And sometimes my execution is not as good as I would like. But... Uh, but I can't, you know, I'll, I'll go, if I'm working with an artist, I'll talk to the artist or I'll talk to an editor or something and usually can get something. And I've told you, Jersey, the story of uh, working on a Batman story for Dick Giordano at DC and he looked at my script and he flipped through the pages and he pointed to a panel and he says, right here, Dan, here, here's where you went kind of wrong. And I looked at it and I said, oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. How did you pick out that one thing? What was great about working with Dick was when he found the crux of a problem, he trusted you to then come up with a solution. You just needed the light shined on it, um, hmm. which is great. So, yeah, I mean, I do have people that I can talk to who uh, either when I'm talking about an idea or I'm showing them, you know, where a script is going. Because, uh, I, yeah, I want, I want honest feedback. And I especially want people to tell me, you know, you'll never sell this idea. You would you'd be much better off. Spending your time on something else. Um. <laughs> that is, uh, yeah, getting uh, trusted, honest feedback is super valuable. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, but and what's interesting is like, none of this is like deterministic at the same time. Because if you have that feedback and yet the need to still tell it and the resources to tell it, right. I, I think a lot of, a lot of folks will uh, continue through, especially with independent projects. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the one of the lines that I will give back to people who ask me, where do you get your ideas? Which, you know, for people like us is kind of a, not a silly question, but it's, it's so outside our frame of reference. You know, the mm-hmm. ideas are all around. So my response to where do you get your ideas is basically, if you have a certain cast of mind, the ideas are all around. The real problem is figuring out which are the good ones. Uh, and... And both in terms of, you know, they make any sense, they'll make a good story, and that you could really execute. You know, that's not always easy to know. Uh, the, and you find that the people, I think, with the most fertile imaginations, who are great because they keep throwing these ideas against the wall, but they'll come up with more stinkers, absolutely. But I admire that, you know, especially if they came up with the stinkers and they got paid for it and it got published. That's great. That's, <laughs> I'm, I'm all for that. 
it's it's funny. I just I just recorded uh, a Saturday supercast, which won't drop for probably a couple weeks because I'm waiting for, to fix my computer mm-hmm. on which the audio it resides. <laughs> that was the only thing not backed up was that one darn thing. Uh, but uh, in in it, I talked with uh, Raina Telgemeier about a cartoon that we both grew up on, and one of the things that she said about the cartoon and, and our summary of the whole thing was. It had all of the parts, but not the sum. And as I was as I was mm. chewing on that, I was like, "Oh yeah, it's like it had everything, all the elements you expect in this kind of story, this kind of hero, this kind of villain, this kind of conflict, these kinds of characters." But the execution just came in at like eighty percent, so it didn't have the final sum that you would expect from those ingredients. So it's not the ideas, it's not the where do they come from, because we can get those. It's how do you get them to uh, chemically coexist in a way that you get a new thing out of it, right? That's right. And then you've got the, the great line from Chuck Jones about animation, who said that animation should be equal parts hard work and love, and when you're finished, only the love should show. Right. Yeah, that's if you don't if you don't accomplish that, if the gears are showing, you know, even if they're good gears, even if they're really well constructed gears, you haven't finished the package. Yeah. You gotta hide your well, work. Unlike school, you gotta hide your work. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. That, that I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that. That's pretty good. I'm gonna use that in my classroom. Mm-hmm. So, I feel like I feel like we kind of walked around that one for the curveball. Do you guys feel warmed up? Are we ready to get into topic? Totally. Sure. Ready. All right. Well, then I'm gonna play the bridge music. Going 10,000 feet up, looking at the topic in abstract, looking at it from every conceivable angle, looking for hidden dimensions and depths. Uh, can't think too hard in this section of the show. So what is our topic? Our topic is, well, given that Dan and I just finished this book and it's coming out in uh, like a month or so, uh, we talk about nonfiction comics, writing nonfiction comics, because, Dan, you spent the, a long time writing nonfiction comics over the past year and a half or so, by more time than you wanted to think about writing nonfiction oh, yeah. comics. <laughs> so, um, I'm, you know, I, I got to wonder, I mean, just to, to start digging into this thing, is like, I got to wonder, like, as a guy who, who spent the majority of his career dealing in fantasy for children... Why the Kennedy assassination? Where did that come from? Where you're like, hey, you know what? I'd like to spend a lot of time working on is this. Well, so there's there's the reason that I thought was the reason in the first place, and there's the reason that was revealed to me over time, uh, and then there's the fact that I didn't realize just how very long it was going to take. So that <laughs> that's a separate issue. Um, but, you know, I was reading uh, Robert Caro's uh, fourth volume of his biography of Lyndon Johnson, which finally gets to uh, LBJ's becoming president upon the assassination of uh, President Kennedy. And I suddenly think, oh, my friend Ernie Colon did a great adaptation of the 9-11 report, which came out of the fifth anniversary of the attacks. And it was it was terrific. That was when Ernie told me he was doing that book, I think I literally slapped my head, saying, Why didn't I come up with that idea? Because it's just a cool, cool idea. And I said, this would be a chance to do something really cool with Ernie, was the starting thought. What I discovered over time, over the you know, close to well, let's say a year and a half that I was working on this book in one form or another was that I was uh, I was 10 years old when President Kennedy was killed and I still hadn't gotten over it. Uh, that's, I think, what, what drove it, is that it was a deep and wounding personal experience that I was still gnawing on in some part of my psyche. So that's, mm. that's I think, what drove me as much as the, hey, this would be a cool idea to work with Ernie, and you know. Okay, so I had to. I had to know. Go ahead, Dan. I had to know more. I had to know more. I had to. I, I realized there were mi- there were missing pieces still from my experience of of the the assassination, being that ten year old and living through the '60s and seeing what's changed in the world. You know, I, I knew that it wouldn't be like Ernie's 9/11 book, a straight adaptation. I knew that it would have to be challenged. 
Uh, I didn't know at the beginning, and we'll talk about this, I didn't know how I was going to do that. Uh, but I, it just seemed immediately like something I could sink my teeth into. Well, I'm, it makes me super curious to ask this question then, Dan. It, mm -hmm. um, through the journey of that project, did it lead to greater insight and, and also some sort of closure for you personally? Oh, yeah, yeah, it definitely definitely did. It's um, I actually write in the afterword to the book about um, my experience at one point of going through the Zapruder film, you know, the home movie that was taken during the moments of the assassination, going through it frame by frame by frame over and over again in this one section and how emotionally trying that was. But realizing why it was emotionally trying and realizing that I was, in writing this book, figuring something out about my experience, about my generation's experience, about the arguments, all the arguments, not only about the assassination that have followed in our country, yeah, it brought me to a place where I can... You know what it brought me to? It brought me to a place where I can accept some uncertainty. I can accept living with, yeah, I have my idea of what happened, but the 100% proof is never going to be out there. The answers are never going to be out there. Lee Harvey Oswald's motivation, assuming that he's the assassin or whatever, that's never going to be known. Their, uh, living with the unknown part of it was probably what was driving me, what was hurting me for a very long time. Realizing that I could find a way of living with it was, yeah, really helpful. Wow. Okay. Rounding back on some things you were saying earlier, uh, that you, you kind of were, were talking about, oh, you slapped your head when you found out Ernie was doing the 9-11 report because what a great idea. What what an idea with, with like a, a hook for a wide audience, right? Um, mm -hmm. And and I myself, I mean, in, when I take this galley around, I take it and show it to people. Like when we were just at ALA a couple weeks ago, and you know, I'll have my little funny graphic novel at the front with a big furry monster on, it, and people are like, oh, that's cute. And then I hold this up, I'm like, oh, boom, recognition. This is something that I connect with. This is historical. This is there's 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 a lot of um, triggers are being fired when you make a book about, a, a, you know, a, an event that everybody knows about. Or maybe not, given that a comic strip Dan sent me recently. <laughs> where, well, how did that comic strip go, Dan? Oh, that, oh, that was um, that was the one where. Uh, okay, so one character says uh, says my dad said uh, when he was born, uh, John F. Kennedy was president, and another character says, "Boy, there's a name for the where are they now file." And then there's a silent <laughs> panel where somebody whispers, and and the one is. You know, we never finish our textbooks in my history class. <laughs> so, yeah. But yeah, hopefully, hopefully people do know that. I've been really surprised at how riveted people seem to be when they hear that I've been working on this, that we've been working on this. It's like, yeah. wow, I really want to see that. So, okay, so there's, there's the aspect of it that's, boy, this is something that's got marketing legs built into it, right? It, it, it sells itself as a concept. Even the timing, right? It was really important that we hit the deadline because it had to come out in September of 2014 because that's the 50th anniversary of the release of the report, right? So there's that. But then there's also the part that you talked about that was a personal thing. It was something that happened to me when I was 10 and I never got over it and this I had to, you know, investigate this thing. So it was a graphic investigation not only of the assassination, and, and this is in the book. I mean, I, I drew the pages. Uh, it's also about your reflections on how the times were before and after and how you guys, with uh, your generation, dealt with it at the time, right? Um, yeah. So, okay, here's here's the, this is almost like curveball territory. Which comes first? Is it the, the oh, that's a great marketing idea and I got a, and I have a personal uh, stake in this topic? Or is it, I got a stake in this topic and as I think about it more, oh, suddenly the marketing, the marketability of it reveals itself to me, right? So I, we're, we're, I never, I, I never thought it was a great, it, it, that it's a great marketing idea was only revealed to me from others, starting you know, starting with um, our agent when when we had lunch, and I mentioned to him that hey, I had this idea. I thought would this be cool? And his eyes go wide. He says, Yeah, you know, let's. So obviously he thought it was something. But even then, for me, it was 
that's something that I can sell. That's good. Selling is good. You know, because, you know, these people who say that they write for themselves, I completely don't understand. I write to be read by other people. So I want, look, I like to be paid. It's great. But as much as I like to be paid, I, I want to be published so that other people will read what I've written, and I'll communicate with them, and maybe they'll respond, even if they don't respond to me directly. So, yeah, so I was really thrilled at the chance to have something uh, uh, something published and out there, and that was great, but I still didn't think of it as this great, you know, kind of marketing coup. I didn't think of Ernie's book that way, really, when he told me about it. Well, I thought it was great, there. something that comics would do really, really well. Ah, Okay. Okay, well, perhaps marketing was the, a poor choice of words. Maybe what I was thinking of is something you said. Was, is it sellable? Does this thing seem like something I can sell? Right. Um, oh, actually, or maybe will this resonate? And then as a, as a, as a side effect through, of that resonance, uh, what sort of in, in people would need to buy it to be able to, to connect with it, right? Um, but, but the primary effect sounds like is that you just want to affect people with this. And this, this oh. is a... This is something that 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 would would help you accomplish that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Writing to me is. I mean, I I love all that goes into writing technically and creatively and all of that. But at its core, it's about talking to other people in some way. So yeah, I say this is this is something. If I'm inter if I think this is a good idea, other people are going to think it's a good idea, and I will be able to convey it in comics and give it. Um, give it a new frame that comics really, really do well. Putting, putting. This is what I discovered. Partly reading Ernie's book, the 9/11 book, but then in thinking about it, and obviously doing this, comics can do this, focusing you on what's important, so, so well. Uh, it's, it's just phenomenal. Interesting. So, like, liter like somehow putting it through the lens of comics, it um, it was like a way to um, to Im imbue this tale with um, better transmittability. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. You know. So, so the story I tell is about Ernie when he when he was interviewed one time about on the radio about the 9/11 book, and somebody asks him. Well, aren't you, you know, oversimplifying a very complex subject? And Ernie's response was, when we do comics, we're not in the business of simplifying. We're in the business of clarifying. Mm. And that is so right, you know. And to think about the Kennedy assassination, to think about the unbelievably turgid writing of the Warren Report itself, <laughs> the prose is just, I think, intentionally ghastly. Um, and... Because, you know, if it's hard to get through, then it must be very authoritative. Um, and taking that and, and making it into something where what it's saying, what other people are arguing uh, to challenge it are saying, comics can really do that. They can clarify, okay, this is what's important. This is what you need to see if you want to understand why these arguments have been going on for half a century. Uh, you know, if you saw, you, you sort of know it, you know there's been an argument. If you saw the, the Oliver Stone JFK movie, you say, oh, wow, it's like, boy, that was a big debate, you know? And it's like, well, it, it kind of it wasn't, and it wasn't. The Oliver Stone movie depicts, I think, not, not the greatest version of the, of the anti-Warren Commission uh, perspective, but you know, set that aside. He did the country a service by having um, uh, by having Congress then pass laws that released some of the records before they were going to be released, which is which is great. Um, but it's uh, but I think it also made a lot of people think that anything that came out in innuendo in that movie must be true. It's like they it's like Oliver Stone and the Warren Commission were playing the same game from opposite sides, which was let's. You know, let's convince rather than lay out. This is my sure. big my big complaint about the Warren Commission is their lack of transparency, their lack of willingness to say, "Here's what we got," 
and it's not everything. This goes back to my own experience that I was talking about before of having to be comfortable not knowing everything. The Warren Commission made a huge mistake, even if they're right on the facts, they made a huge mistake in being as presumptuous and non-transparent as they were. And honestly, the people who have come and challenged them, and I, I kind of put Oliver Stone in this category too, kind of behave the same way. They they make their they make their emotionally persuasive case in this comic book. And the edit, the publisher wants us to call it a nonfiction graphic novel, but in this comic book, we try to be clear. Ah, and and so that's where that's where I think what it's almost like we we're at we're talking about this question of sort of finding the narrative in here, and. Yeah. You're you're almost on a. Qu I'm what, what I'm hearing is it's like you embarked on a quest for clarity, and that inherently, like the title of the book, using the word investigation, right? Um, it you're investigating, and uh, what was that part of the um, the basis of saying like, wow, there is a story here because we could we could examine this, or or how did that work? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, first of all, I said, okay, I can be fair to all sides, which is helpful. And that comics can comics can do this really remarkable thing. Now, and I, I have to say that I, I sent in with the pitch like seven pages of sample script, none of which I knew used, and none of which techniques I probably used, but were kind of on in the ballpark of comics techniques that make this make sense. Like the idea, just the idea that you can repeat a scene, you re repeat a panel, uh, as a callback to the reader. So they say, okay, we're going to see this now. We're going to see this from from a different perspective, and reinterpret it. We have uh, pages. I think uh, I think it was forty and forty one and forty two and forty three in of the story pages. Yes, where, I know what you're talking about, Dan. Yeah. Right. So, so what we've got is these two double-page spreads that are essentially the same pages. There are some differences, but the structure is the same. A bunch of the panels are the same, and it's taking place at the time of the assassination in Dealey Plaza in Dallas. On one of those spreads, you are experiencing what it was like to be someone who thought. Uh, who thought you heard shots come from the Texas School Book Depository. On the next spread, you're somebody who thought you heard shots coming from the grassy knoll. And the point of that was, well, there are a number of points to, to that, uh, but one is to say that a slight difference in perception can make a world of difference in what you're going to come, come away with as far as your beliefs are concerned. And Rob, it's, it's 42 and 43, and the, the bottom of the first spread is a bunch of people screaming uh, in front of the Texas School Book Depository while a policeman is running at the uh, hmm. the, the depository. Ah, uh, right. You know what so I'm talking I, about? Yeah, okay. So would that be... There you yeah. go. It's actually... Oh, I'm sorry. It's 38 and uh, 37 huh. in, have, in this because, we, yeah, uh, there because we, the spreads are in the right. PDF. There we, we go. I got it. Numbers, unfortunately. Yeah. Yes, yes. All right. So, yeah, here's the first one Dan was talking about on the screen for those who are actually watching the video. And we see that middle tier is the same as on the next spread. It's it's at 12 uh, it's at 12:30 when the pacao 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 happens. That's mm -hmm. another callback that you do in the book, Dan. Yeah, it was it was important since since I realized one of the things that was going to be helpful was to return to scenes that that the reader immediately know where the readers know exactly where they are when we go back to 12:30 November 22nd 1963 Dealey Plaza the sound the pacao sound effect is okay reader you know where you are we're starting this over we've we've dialed back and we're unspooling this one more time we're going to do it with a different cast of characters or a different perspective this time and it was uh that was really helpful to be able to do that. So, so on these two spreads, the neat thing that you came up with is this idea that okay, the middle tier is is the the motorcade, Kennedy waving, the Pacao sound effects, 
the people's reaction, and then the the, the limo driving under the triple underpass, get, getting out of there, right? Right, but and the art is identical on both spreads. But the top and bottom tiers on both spreads are more about witness testimony and reaction surrounding the different locations from which people suspect the shots came. Right, so on the 42-43 spread, or I don't know what it's going to be in the final book. Is it going to be 48, 49? I'm not sure. Um, but we've got the people who are all around the Texas School Book Depository, giving their. And this is another neat thing that I, I, this is so layered because like the you have the characters giving their testimony while they're performing the actions that they're testifying about. So you've got like this du duality of time going on there too. This this compression that happens that only comics can do well because this would be really weird in a movie if people were doing this. But in a comic, it feels absolutely natural. But mm -hmm. um, but then so then we go to the reaction. The cow cow. The motorcade runs away, and then there's all the people in front of the Texas School Book Depository screaming. And then we see the line of uh, the caption that reads, "But this is only one perspective." And then we go to the other spread, and we get different testimony from a different area. Here's three guys on the, the triple underpass. And they're over by the the what is that fence called again? It was just the picket fence. They, 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 people call it the picket fence or the stockade fence. Yeah, it's, and then police officer running up the hill. People finding footprints and cigarette butts on the other side of the picket fence, and the people over by the grassy you knoll all reacting, thinking that this is where the shots came from. But right. using that middle tier of art, not as not as a tool of laziness. So let's expedite this. But this is. Here's the event again, surrounded by a different perspective, a different context, right? Right. Yeah. There, there, are, there are, are all sorts of things we ended up doing, that, that were again things that things that comics can do really well, that help the reader have that sense of time and place and clarity, and the idea, like you're saying, not a lazy repetition of panels, but a we need a visual cue that. We're not going in sequence. This is not. This next two-page spread is not happening a happening after the previous one. It's happening at the same time. Putting in those silent panels does that. Yeah. Yeah. But that's you know that that's one of them. You were talking about and the you know the pacao pacao sound effect every time we go back to twelve thirty is is another one. The the one about the trickiest one. I think was the other one you mentioned, which is that while the events are taking place in Healy Plaza or later that day, we give we give some of the characters word balloons that are taken from testimony that they gave months later. So it's verbatim, it's in the past tense, but it is merged with the experience as it happened visually. I was really committed to having as few captions as possible. Even when I talked with Ernie at the start of this, I said, you know, I love the 9-11 book, but the biggest, the biggest drawback to it, I thought, was too many captions. And, and he basically agreed. There were, there were too many captions in that book. And we're just... Comics work better with word balloons. I won't go into my whole spiel. You've heard it too many times, and you're. Oh, I I know. I, I well, first of all, I have not heard it enough times. Uh, I can never get tired of hearing you talk about this stuff. But uh, for the audience's sake, I would love for you to go into this this whole idea of like why. Oh, all right, fine. So, so what if there's a lot of captions? I mean, that's words. That's reading. Yeah. Right. Captions. So I have to. So I, I have to say that my feeling about this, I understand, is impressionistic. It can't be proved. I believe that. Word balloons are more capable of existing within the art as if, as if they're right there, as, as they're on the same layer. Let's use Photoshop terminology now, right? The, even though when we did this, it wasn't the case. In the reader experience, the word balloon is on the same layer as the art. The word balloon is art. You know that. I, I, mean, I hope your listeners know, know that. Word balloon is an important visual element on the page. Text is an important visual element on the page. Thank you for saying that. Yes, well, it's absolutely crucial. And and captions, because they're rectilinear, and most panels are rectilinear, look more like cutouts or layers on top. They look like blocks built on other blocks. Mm. Um, and also, they're not. They don't have tails that go to people talking. 
so they're even less integrated with the visuals. Uh, they exist on a layer above. And while word balloons, thought balloons, there should be way more thought balloons in comics, but that's another whole riff. Uh, and <laughs> well, well, I'll do a little bit of it. People who write comic books today, uh, some of them, not me, not others, a bunch of people who write comic books today have replaced thought balloons with first-person narration captions, and that is nuts! I mean, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> it, honestly, it's, it's, you are you are um, you are taking the reader out of the story instead of keeping them inside it for a purpose that I can't quite divine. Uh, it's fashion, I know. I think it seems more writerly to have more captions sometimes, but you can't be writerly if what you're writing is comic books. You just you just can't. So. So yeah, so that was that was the thing. I was really committed to the notion that that there would be as few word, a few captions as possible. And look at the material; you would expect it could be entirely word balloons. But if you do that, you end up with what's more like an illustrated book. And I didn't want to do an illustrated book; I wanted to do a comic. Uh, it's uh, yeah, this is. I wanted to make this as comic-y as possible, as I said to our editor over and over again. Um, Oh, and and I was in on some of those discussions, and I mean, hats off to you. Like you were actually being a champion for the form, for for the medium in those discussions that you were having with a lot of the thing, the lot of the battles you fought. And I don't want to say battles as in it was like contentious. It was more like it was debate. It was like kicking around ideas and deciding what was best for the project. And whenever a suggestion came up of like, hey, maybe we should do this that would make me go, ooh, that's not very comic-y, you went right in there with like, with the shield and the saber and and uh, straight and straightened things out. It was awesome. Well, so, well thank uh, you. I mean, I, I wanted to do it, you know, and I, I understood the the um, the impulse to uh, to decomicify, you know, because you look at a project like this and you say, we're going to get a lot of non-comics natives. Reading this, hopefully, uh, and you don't want to make it impossible for them to read because, as we all know, comics are easy to read. They are great for building all sorts of comprehension and all sorts of all the all sorts of decoding skills when you're young. And if you start reading a comic when you're 30, it is really confusing because you haven't because it's it's learning a foreign language. Uh, a foreign storytelling language, anyway, and uh, and so there was concern on on the part of Abrams that we might alienate some of those people, and so I I went to bat uh, for that on the um, on the issue of these word balloons. I I sent our editor Carol uh, a page from Chris Weir's Building Stories, uh, which you figure everybody's reading Building Stories because. It's Chris Weir, and everybody's talking about it, and all of that. And, and uh, what Chris did was have his character going through, uh, going through events, and her thought balloons were really from her future, you know. And it worked out really well. But it, you know, it, it has to do with the notion, Jersey, that you and I have discussed a lot, which is that comics allow you to portray very malleable realities and sometimes all at once you know you can you can have past and future colliding with each other uh, it's just natural in comics uh, and because as we've also discussed because comics are drawn because nobody says oh that's a special effect there can't be two versions of the character they uh, uh, except except for when they did the Winklevoss twins in in uh, the social network you knew that it was, you know, a match shot or whatever, or a you know clever photography or cutting and all of that. In comics, you don't have to stop and think what the special effect of is. You don't have to stop thinking what the special effect is. You look at the picture and you believe it. That's mm. really important. You believe in that reality, and because comics not make you but allow you to believe in whatever reality is being portrayed. You can do so much interesting stuff. You can collide time, and you can you can have another thing we did have Lee Harvey Oswald portrayed in black and white while everything else is in color. 
That's where I was hoping uh, you'd go. I'm... Thank you for bringing that up. So I'm I'm gonna try to find a page where that a good example of that. Um, Rob, I, I've got page 18 on the PDF uh, as an example of everybody else being in color and Oswald being rendered in black and white. Now, this one I'm handing entirely to you, Dan. Is is this was you know some some of the ideas that we've already discussed was like a lot of back and forth. Like as a matter of fact, one of the scenes that I hope we can talk about in a little bit more detail later is um, the flashback scene to your youth, where there was a concern over the fact that the character Dan, who is like the stand-in character for you, the narrator, is speaking present tense, reflecting on the past while he's performing the actions in the past, but then there's characters talking to that, the child version of Dan in the scene, right? And so I... I, I right, think, we have to work that. Yeah, and, I, and I, think, I seem to remember that it was Carol who suggested, like, maybe we can change the word balloon colors or something so that there's, like, a difference between, like, the different time periods in the, the scene. But we talk about that in a second. But right now I want to talk about this Oswald thing. I, this one was all you. You came up with this idea, and it worked out so good in the book. Yeah, I was, re yeah, I was really pleased with how it worked out. I will, and I'll take credit for it, although one of the great things about comics is over time you forget who did what. Which is really nice. It's like a, it makes it makes it seem, at least retrospectively, like more of a collaboration. You know, I mean, I talk to people and, and, and who will look at something and say, "Oh man, this artist is terrible," and I'll say, "You don't know that. This might be the artist doing the best possible job on a really mis mistaken script." You know, there's, there's I think those sorts of things happen all the time. But when it came to this, the the thought was uh, that well. Honestly, part of the thought was we are working on a tight deadline and would there be ways of doing interesting things with color, whether it's knockout color, whether it's black and white, whether it's whatever. And I'm obviously doing a lot of reading about Oswald. And if you think about him, he's, he's the mystery. He is the central mystery in this entire story. If he got in that building, carried a rifle, and shot at JFK and killed him. Nobody can really tell you why. I have my own ideas, you know, and others have theirs, and others will point to the Warren Commission and say, you know, they never really said, they never really committed themselves, and so maybe it's more questionable than we, we they would have us believe. But in any case, he's the mystery. And anybody who tells you they know Oswald, Here's where we go from literal to metaphorical, figurative. Anybody who tells you they know the truth about Oswald is coloring him in, right? They mm -hmm. are putting their own opinion as an overlay on that guy, and we do not know. So if you want Oswald to be the guy we don't know, I thought that having him be the guy in black and white the guy who you, you, we'd better not color in, or we'd be lying to people, uh, made a lot of sense, and it, it kind of worked. You know, I, I don't know I, if people reading it will 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 sort of articulate it that way, but they'll get something. They'll get they'll be in that ballpark, I think, when they see that. Uh, I remember when I was coloring the book, and, and uh, you gave me that instruction of like, let's just do Oswald in pure black and white, no color at all in him, and I remember thinking. Mm -hmm intellectually, like, that sounds pretty interesting. That sounds like it could work. And then when I finally put the page, I was like, oh my god, does it work? He, st it, it was, it's, he stands apart without you having to say, Oswald, with all that description you just did about like coloring in Oswald and making assumptions about him or coming up with our re rationale for him, you say it instantly by just knocking the color out of the character in the story. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, and he's a ghost. He's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he is. Yeah, wow. <laughs> but but I mean, see, this is the kind of stuff that like when we were working on the book, and also, I mean, it's just it, it. This is why I get so cheerful and enthusiastic about comics as a medium, is because you get to do stuff like this. Right. You and you know, and this with this one, with the Oswald one, I wasn't sure it was going to work, but it seemed to make sense. And the responses I got from Carol, from you, from Ernie, you know, all seemed positive. Yeah. You know, the thing about. The thing about the word balloons I really fought for and I really believed in and I knew it was going to work. This was one, well, it wasn't going to hurt. And I just had a feeling that it could be something special that, again, comics allow us to do. 
you also came up with this idea of of separating between because like you do have some caption boxing going on in this in this book. Yeah. Um, but you did some really kind of cool stuff with finding a way to mark when the narrator is talking, when it's testimony, and when it's Warren Commission quotes. Right. Like you had like this kind of breakdown in your mind this this system of okay and and I, when because I, I lettered the book and I remember you calling me out several times going like hey, hey wait that's a direct quote from the Warren report it has to be formatted in this way otherwise right. we've thrown it away and we're looking at a page right now. Where this this happens, so I wonder if you could address that, like the decision process and coming with that. Well, you know, you if you there are so many disparate elements, there are so many arguments that the reader really needs to know what they're getting. You know, I want to. Um, <laughs> what was the uh, Stan Max real life funnies that ran in the Village Voice that uh, had the in the first panel? He said, "All uh, all dialogue guaranteed." Uh, guaranteed true verbatim or something like that, and it was like, and so I was I there's almost every piece of dialogue is verbatim dialogue here. There's a couple of little bridging things occasionally, but so it was important that that dialogue always be the person speaking. It was important that a quote from the Warren Report always be a quote known to be. A quote from the Warren Report. In fact, the first time I use it, which is I think page ten of the story, um, I have a lead-in, uh, a lead-in caption. And another thing about captions is, as much as possible, we had captions float instead of being boxed, which would integrate them more into the story. Uh, so it says the Warren Commission report describes much of what comes next in minute detail. Dot dot dot. And then we have these yellow. Warren Commission balloons. So I don't have to say, and what you're reading now is a direct quote from the Warren Commission, because that sucks. You know, that's that, you don't want to do that. <laughs> you want to let you want to let people know, um, just in the act of reading, they figure it out. You know, you give them you give them what they need to know. Uh, to know what's happening, and I think on the next page is the first time we use a uh, this, uh, the page eleven then has the uh, uh, Secret Service agent Clint Hill giving his testimony while he's pushing Jackie Kennedy back into the car, um, and so you give you give cues to the reader uh, to let them know what's what, um, and and then because I was committed to the word balloons, sometimes I really wanted the um, I wanted the Warren Commission quotations to come from the mouths of the Warren Commissioners. They're in a room talking or they're just presenting themselves to us. And so it's word balloons with tails pointing to one or two in sequence of the commissioners, whatever it is. But they're more rectangular with rounded corners, so they're more like balloons, but they're more rectangular, with tails pointing to the speaker and they're yellow. So it's not that Alan Dulles said this line in the room. Reader knows that the yellow captions are the quotes from the Warren report. It's just a visual way of mixing it up and reminding you also, as the reader, these were there were people who were responsible for this. You know, this is this doesn't exist out of a vacuum. Uh, so there's so there are those so there are those kind of funny halfway balloon halfway quotations and like I said, uh, the ones the ones that float uh, when we can do that. Uh, that's helpful as well. Okay, and and Rob, I'm I'm totally hogging the ball on this, um, but I've got another question that is uh, could potentially sound self-serving. I hope it doesn't, because there were two artists in the book, and that was me and Ernie. We both had, and like a lot of my uh, challenge in the book was learning to work in Ernie's style, which we can go into in detail if there's time. But right. um, there always be another episode because I want to talk about writing. Because something that happened, and I, I don't know if this happened between me and you, but I know it happened between Ernie and the rest of us, was Ernie would take a scene, and he would do his thing with it. And you'd get it, and you'd say, oh, that's not what I was expecting at all, but boy, oh boy, is it good. And I think of um, the, the page with, um, I want to say it was page 25, with Oswald yeah. uh, in the, the fateful six seconds. Um, let me see if I can find it in the PDF. Um, right. 
You know what I'm talking about, though. So I'm, oh, yeah, like, here, exactly the, about. the question I have is, is like when you're working with the artist, how does their interpretation and input influence what you write, if at all? Yeah, you know, so this was this was really interesting. Um, I came first of all, I came to understand how Ernie does this stuff. You'll remember that when you first started doing a kind of test page of penciling, I looked at it and I said, there's something off here. It's not badly drawn. It's not, you know, it, it certainly could be rendered in Ernie's, Ernie's line style, but there's something wrong. And I said, wait, I think I know. And I went to the 9-11 book to check and said, Ernie does not do down shots or up shots. He, ha he does not do angled kind of uh, uh, point of view. Everything is on the level, on the horizontal. Um, there are no worm's eye views and bird's eye views. Um, and that's, I think, something that he did without thinking about it too much to, be, uh, to, to have a sort of repertorial style for his, for his nonfiction books. And it makes a lot of sense. And then, of course, as we went along, Jersey, you and I both, I think, discovered that those restrictions actually still allow you to do a whole lot. Like there's the there's the panel you did. I can think of two that you did. One is when the car is being the limo is being inspected, uh, and the point of it's not a worm's eye view, but it's a it's a high enough. You know, the, the vertical of the point of view is enough that you can be both at but at the side of the crouching uh, Secret Service guy and on the other side of the car with the standing Secret Service guy who's inspecting the crack in the windshield. Yeah, let me um, see so if like, I can oh, find that page. Oh, that's kind of cool. That, yeah, yeah, Rob, that, that, that page is 64. That would seem to violate... There we go. Okay, I'm pulling it up while you talk about it. Because I remember this page, because the original, when I thumbnailed it, I remember doing it as a down shot, looking at the limo and the two guys inspecting right. it. And you called me out on that. You looked at the thumbnails and you said, wait a second, that's not a very Ernie shot. And I was like, oh, what is an Ernie yeah. shot in this situation? And you, you right. brought it to my attention. You said, hey, he, everything's on the horizontal. And then as I went through and looked at his stuff, I was like, oh, and Ernie creates depth with overlap. He doesn't use geometrical depth right. as much as he uses just overlapping pieces to create a sense of depth. So as long as I have a sense of overlapping and everything's on the horizontal, it should land somewhere in Ernie's territory. And that, yeah, we're looking at that shot right now. Yeah. Right, and six, six pages after that, so I don't know what page number you have, uh, Rob, but six pages after that is the scene where the transportation casket, casket the one where the president's body was flown from Dallas to Washington but wasn't used for the funeral. Uh, it's yeah. being, um, it's dumped into the um, oh. oh, so it's seven, the ocean. It's seven PDF. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, you're at the level of the water. Yeah. I mean, the point of view is at the level, there we go. The point of view is, is the level of the water and yet we're seeing the, the cargo plane that, that the Yes, it's being dropped from, and it does not come off as a this is a worm's eye view. Right. It comes off as as a uh, an all encompassing kind of thing. So that was definitely something we had to sort of get used to in uh, uh, in Ernie what Ernie's approach afforded us. Uh, and then he also came up with cool cool stuff like that page what story page twenty five, where mm -hmm. he. Um, He's. I say to him, okay, we're just doing. We've we've gone through. We've done a double page spread that has the six hours from the time Oswald arrives at work, in a timeline, and then a, one more page that's a timeline of just the six seconds of shooting. Um, it's page twenty-two, Rob. And and what we have is. Uh, I said to I said to Ernie, so maybe you could run. You know, stopwatches. Do something different from the timeline. Run stopwatches down the page. And, geez, I mean, I would have come up with something really dumb looking. But he, 
I mean, he ends up riveting you with that with that stuff. You know, wow, look at that. You know, I mean, just just look at. I mean, yeah, there's this there's the stopwatches counting off the seconds, and yet they're carrying you and leading you and and you know making you pay attention instead of being a gimmick along the side of the page. It's it's right. great. He, he also did something. I'm going to say one more nice thing, and then I'm, then I'm going to complain about him. Um, he did this. Uh, he did so on page, I guess, a few pages earlier, uh, 23 in mine. So maybe it's maybe it's around page, story page uh, 16, 17. Uh, there's where Lady Bird Johnson is uh, leaving. Uh, oh, that's. Uh, that's before we are. Yeah. Yeah. Page thirteen in the PDF, right, where Lady Bird Johnson is looking out the window of the car. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so here's another example of where I'm using her later diary entry to describe what she felt like when she was being driven back to Love Field to fly back to Washington, and cast a flag with a, with a flagpole with a flag at half staff and. I wrote in the script, you know, if there's some way of showing them both, I have no idea what it would be. Well, I'm an idiot. I'm a writer, you know. At least I, at least I knew what I wanted. But Ernie puts the reflection of the building in the flagpole in the window while we st still still see Mrs. Johnson, and it's like, oh, that's what I wanted. I just didn't know. Uh, so it was really, it's really great. That's uh, artists are so, great. I, so sometimes it, it is a situation where you just need to trust the artist, is, is yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, or know that, in a case like this, know that it's pointless for me to try to figure out a visual approach to something that I don't have the chops for, or I would take, would be a very, very long time coming, and I have plenty of other stuff to do on this book. Um, so... <laughs> So that was yeah. It's important. It was important to trust him. This this page actually got reconfigured a couple of times because uh, there were issues that felt like crowding to Ernie uh, in the early part of the book. I think there was too much crowding as I got to understand the style better because of the timeline. I was I was still working on the script while many of the early pages were being drawn. So it wasn't like we could look over it in a leisurely way and say, you know what, let's make this more into a double page spread. A couple of times we were able to do that, uh, but there were some crowded pages and that caused a problem for Ernie. But the problem in reverse is, and I almost hate this because I want to trust the artist, but the pacing, especially when you are trying to dole out bits of information that are important, they have to come in chunks that the reader can easily digest and hold on to, I I had to control the page breaks. When Ernie and I were doing Amethyst, I didn't worry about controlling the page breaks. Um, I, you know, he would always come up with a better page turner. You know, the, the shot that makes you want to go to the next page, right? Mm -hmm. I needed to be able to say, how much information can I get on this page that will cohere? Not visual information. I did... I mean, the second stage, the second step is visual information. The first step is factual content in a lot of these pages. And that was rough on Ernie, and it was rough on me when he said, how about if I just, you know, spill over? No, the reader won't, the reader won't retain it any lo longer. This stuff all has to belong, has, this stuff belongs together, it has to stay together. Uh, it was very nice when he told me that his, his wife, uh, had he, when he was just puzzling over one page and just getting frustrated with it, and he was starting to make a change, he said to me, well, Ruth said to me, maybe Dan has a reason for doing it that way. <laughs> <laughs> now, the fact that my friend of 30-some-odd years didn't come up with that himself <laughs> is a little disconcerting. But yeah, Dan had a reason for it. Always, always discussable, you know, always something we could talk about. But I did. I had to. Um, I had to get those. I had to fit those pages. Okay, I want to talk so. about one more thing uh, that I've got on my list, and I do want to hand it over to Rob because we, Rob's been so patient with us uh, while yeah. we've been still here? freaking out about. He's still there, <laughs> right, Rob? Okay. I'm the guy behind the PDF. <laughs> <laughs> Ignore the man um, behind the PDF. 
Rob, I'm wondering if you could go to page 103 in the PDF because this was, and I texted you, Dan, when I was thumbnailing yeah. this page. Uh, it, it's one of those rare moments where, as I was working on the book, I, I literally got goosebumps while working on the thing because it was just such a haunting moment in the story. Mm. And what, and, and as we discussed it later on, because like I called you later on, I was like, man, that mm. that page that just blew me away. And I can't figure out why. I can't put my finger on what it is about this page that really grip, gripped me so. But I had, like, reading your script, I had an instant visual picture. Like, oh, that's the only way to do it. Um, and we, we kind of came to this conclusion that it's what we don't show in this scene. Yeah. Because right. what it is, is it's the famous scene of uh, Jack Ruby's assassination of Lee Harvey Oswald, which anybody who's paid attention in history class, they know what that scene looks like. It's a famous photo. Mm -hmm. But you, in the script, decided to have Ruby's testimony uh, for his rationale for what he did playing mm -hmm. in dialogue as he's slowly stalking Oswald. And then in right. the script, you end it with just a blank field and then sort of like after that. like So we have like three panels where it says like, you know, Jack Ruby is convicted of murder and sentenced to, de uh, sentenced to death. Uh, a new trial is ignited uh, on appeal, and it's never held. Jack Ruby uh, succumbs to cancer in January, what is it, 1967. So we see this dialogue. So we, like, it ends on this blank panel with just like sort of these facts about Ruby after the fact. Well, when we were working on the page, Ernie said, hey, maybe we should show Ruby dying of cancer. So he gave us a panel of him on his deathbed. And it looked great. The panel, the drawing was terrific. The drawing was fantastic, but when we put it on the page, we were like, you know, it doesn't work anymore. When we see that, we need to end on that blank moment. So it's just before Ruby shoots Oswald, blank, and then just let the dialogue do the talking. Yeah. And this is one of those moments where I was like, it really hit me that, and I don't want to sound like a jazz guy, but it's what we don't show, right? Yeah. No, there's no question about it. I mean, this, this page is, I mean, I think it's about, it's about two things. It's about... So you talk about slowly stalking, but he wasn't slowly stalking. We create that impression. He darted out and shot. But yeah. because you got to take the time to... That's another reason that dialogue, word balloons are part of the art. If you have to take the time to read it, it slows down the visual progression. Yeah. And, and the idea here was to... It, it's a... It's, it was kind of doing slow mo, you know. Yeah. It's the, really, it's the it's the comics equivalent of, of doing that. And there's a there's a sort of ballet type quality to it because the movement is in my script. You know, look, I'm not going to say choreographed to describe how I said it in my script, but it was. I I think my script gave you the means to choreograph it. You know that it says, yeah. okay, we're um we're moving um. Uh, Ruby is moving into frame as Oswald is moving out of frame. That's yeah. that's the motion dynamic that makes this page one of the things I think that makes this page work is there's so there's not only the things that aren't seen, but there's or let me put it a different way. One of the things that isn't seen is how it might all have happened differently. Right? Um we, the 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 famous photograph is not here, right? right. We're, you know, there's, you. I really love. I want. I, honestly, I'm not gonna take credit for thinking of this as I was writing it because that would be ridiculous. But when I read history that I know in a sense, and yet the outcome of what I'm seeing does not feel predetermined. I know I'm dealing with a with a really good writer, narrative writer of history, because, you know, if if it's a fait accompli, then there's no drama, there's no tension. There there had to be a way to do this page where where there was a sense of drama, a sense of Im the impendingness. Let I can make up a word. The impendingness of it with that motion is what's really important about this page. We we have only on this page we have only the possibility that he's going to shoot Oswald. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Mm, um, that is so good. 
Yeah, I can come up with with a with an explanation that I didn't think of at the time. Anytime you ask. I well, like I said, Dan, you know, it's like at the time I didn't even know why I was reacting to it so much. All I knew was that something happened when. And, and what's funny is this is like the simplest page in the world. It's three horizontal panels, and that's actually something I've gone on record to kind of make fun of in the past. Is like how uh, letterbox style comic book storytelling. Everybody's trying to be like a darn movie, right? Right. Uh, let's play with layout a little bit once in a while. And here I am doing a three panel horizontal three horizontal panel page. You know, not a whole lot of design work happening with the panel layout. Yet it's one of the pages I'm probably most proud of designing in my entire life. Um, um, and you, well, and you want to hmm. go ahead, Rob. No, I I'm I'm I am slightly pent up, so thanks. Awesome. Uh, so it's uh, observing two members of this team like chat about this book. I mean, it's a lot of fun and, and I just you know, a couple of things that uh, um, I, I totally can emphasize this, empathize with uh, reflecting on a project and how you can come up with new rationale and sort of, you know, you get sort of, you can have reflection bias and have things make sense or whatever, but like, um, just here's a, you know, an, an additional observation is that, um, like, to me, the act of, act of design is placement in context with purpose. And what you've done with... Um, making choices about your placement and your context and your purpose is you've created an opportunity even though it's familiar information is you have new emphasis and through the new emphasis you're convi you're, it's like a it's a reperformance as opposed to a regurgitation or re or retelling right, right and right. that creates a new experience and uh, that that uh, very um, the Looking at historical facts, especially when they're removed through the span of time and they're, they're old news stories or what have you, regardless of the impact or the, the, um, the human, any emotion that went into the events, it, they can feel a little bit dry and removed. And mm -hmm. uh, so I would say like the book as an overall piece of art like has so much of this. This moment is a great example of many, many, many that are in the book of how you've succeeded in, in uh, creating that new emphasis and uh, just all right but um, is is um, so what I'm hearing though too is that not all of that is like hyper premeditated and right. so what what was it what's it like for for you guys this is for both of you um, when, when you're making progress through executing on the plan of the story and um, Finding out like uh, like what's what what's some of the criteria that you like what well this is really fitting in with with uh, accomplishing that new emphasis versus you know we get we need to retry we have we have to try a new idea how how did that work Yeah, there were um, one of the things that I discovered was that for a while I was trying to be too clever um, mm -hmm. in you know the things. Because the things that you can do with comics, you know, the this is a cool technique. When I talked earlier about the um, the pitch that I originally made that had the um, that had several pages of script that I used none of that and really none of that technique. Um, I really thought at one point that I could do two people kind of two people doing different perspectives in the same visual space. Uh, that there's almost an overlay of my perspective reality and his perspective reality, um, and you you would have you might have thimble theater at the bottom so that one guy has has a bunch of balloons saying here's here's what's going on here, and another guy is saying here's what's going on here, and it's like I rejected that early on, but I also did a bunch of things that I think. Ham, you know, hamstrung Ernie. I did too many. I tried for too many double-page spreads when the information needed to be more compact. Uh, better spread into into two pages. Um, thing, things like that. So it's uh, the feedback, either from an editor or from Jersey or from Ernie, was you know really valuable and and often <laughs> often late in the day because we started late in the day. So that made it. Kind of nerve-wracking, but you know, nerve-wracking can be good. It can really get you going. 
Um, what, what, yeah, you know, so, the, 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 the expression you used, uh, I forget what, what it was a quote from, but like nothing clarifies the mind, like the threat of the hangman's noose. Oh, yeah, that that, that's right. The, the, <laughs> the immediate prospect of being hanged wonderfully concentrates the mind. That's what it is. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> which is, which is, is variously attributed, but I first heard it attributed to Samuel Johnson, so there you go. Uh, but yeah, I mean, deadlines are great. Uh, <laughs> unless you die from them. Uh, so... <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's always good if you're able to tell the story at at the end of the project. Um, what so so feedback and and deadlines as as far as um keeping things realistic. But there was like um, it sounds like you 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 did go through and 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 do some some of those um refinements based on feedback. Um, what uh, I I just I, I'm just curious about the you know what that was like with um. When you found those when when you found those moments of like this this definitely isn't a um, re um, a conversion from a history history con uh, book context to now it's in comic form right there was something more like there is that that alternate um, infusion of of new insight or what have you um, like how did you know oh. Well, I think there were times when I thought I knew and I was wrong, you know, but then that's when I got the feedback. Mm -hmm. But other times, you know, that page we were just talking about, where, where Jersey is saying, oh, it's the three horizontal panels, and everybody's trying to do three horizontal panels, and you know why that works? It's because telling that piece of the story with that with that additional information that I that I was talking about, the kind of the the ballet, the pot, the sense of possibility, the sense of of incomplete history, that and and especially when it's about when that becomes one guy is walking into frame while another guy is walking out, that's the only way to do that page. It's not following a fashion. So mm -hmm. the 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 best the the best clue that, at least at the script stage, that I've done it right, that I've, I've stayed true to what we're trying to accomplish. In, I thought what you said about it's not regurgitation, but, but re-performance is a great way of putting it. Um, that when, when I know that I've reached that is when I've come up with what I think is the only way for this, this thing to be told on this page. You know, sometimes it was, I mean, there were plenty of pages that were just mixing it up, right? You know, we need to have it vi be visually different. But there's, there's plenty of situations like this uh, where you have to figure out, how am I going to, and this may sound like mixing it up, but it's not. It's, it's like, how am I going to show the three autopsy physicians in a different way this time? Well, let's think about what they're talking about. And then I would have the Jersey knows I had to get very specific about the position of visual information on the page, because if I want, you know, Doctor Fink to be—that's his real name, by the way—if I want Doctor Fink to be both sitting at a at a table testifying, and I want him pointing to a diagram that shows why he believes that the bullet entered the skull here and exited here. That has to be, I have to find the way that that's going to work on the page. And I have to find it, I usually have to find it before Jersey and Ernie did. Um, I think in most cases, they knew, if, if, I, if I didn't have it quite right, they knew what I was going for, and they had the visual sensibility that said, oh, gosh, you know, you're really, you're really close, Dan, but here's, here's how we're going to do it. You know? and, and that was fine. Uh, but yeah, yep. knowing knowing that I've done comics, I, that's what I was saying. I wanted it to be as much comics as possible. When I had a page that I knew was comics, then I knew I knew I was all right. I think of another example where, and and this is this is one of those instances where I don't remember exactly where the suggestion came from. I don't remember whose idea it was, but we were dealing with a scene where. Um, it's the motorcade coming down the street, and there's there's a, a a road sign that obscures Kennedy for just a moment, just before the first shot hits. 
Right, the first shot that goes through his throat, not the the fatal shot. Yeah. And so the problem with the Zapruder film is like that, that's that's like part of the contention of all the evidence is like we don't know what happened just then because there's this road sign in the way. And in the script, there's there's this call out for panel one, Kennedy's waving. Panel two, Kennedy is putting his wrists up like this because he just got shot through the throat. And whoever came up with the idea, there was this idea of putting the road sign sandwiched between those two panels, not in a panel, but sort of like coming from behind the panels and overlapping in this montage kind of way or like this, this collage kind of way, like interfering with the actual, uh, obstructing the flow of the reading experience, uh, so to speak, to kind of emphasize, right, right. visually emphasize this, this, this uh, uh, obstruction of that sign in this really subtle way. Um, yeah. You know, you could have put you, it like a. Did that. Go ahead, Dan. I'm sorry, you did that a couple of different ways. We went back and forth a couple of times about being just obtrusive enough so that it would, so that it would really work. Uh, because execute, even when you have a great idea, executing it can be tricky. Yeah. <laughs> um, and one thing I'm hearing too is that how you guys worked really well and like this this is to me is a theme and tell me if, if this sounds um, like it even somewhat on track or, or what have you is is that like you're dealing like all of you are dealing with layers of information and each of your perspectives and expertise that you're weaving together to convey a final product that represents layers of information which then to me also echoes the like strengths of, of how uh, Ernie's compositions work where he's not as much layering um, uh, a rendering that re that emphasizes how um, the you know our eyes perceive the world around us in perspective, right? It's more it's a more emphasizing the layers of information, yeah. and you know we're working to you know like you you know like you forming your jazz band and everyone's emphasizing their part or de-emphasizing as as needed to create this this uh, the final stack of Facts and flow and time, and then narrative moments and beats. Uh, I want to make sure we got we have enough time to do a little bit on the ground stuff. Dan, do you have like ten more minutes that you could give us? I know we've been going for sure. a while now. If I fall asleep, you know, just just hit me. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll we'll do this fast, but we do have to get on the ground. Rob, is there anything else that we missed in the uh, ten thousand feet no, up section? Uh, not not at all. Um, that that was uh that was cool. Um. Let's let's uh let's get some let's get some uh some practical stuff out of this. Although I do think we. we whoops! <laughs> Sorry, Rob. Nope. I thought I had a time. I saw the look on your face. It looked like you were just about done with that sentence. It's like I'm gonna nail it. I'm gonna nail it. But I said I stepped on you. What were you saying? <laughs> uh, I think you were just layering information and emphasizing um, <laughs> that it was time to go to the next thing. So, uh, yeah, uh, off off we go to to this on the ground. Um, uh, section where uh, hopefully we can pull out a let, let's let's find a few healthy tips that we can okay. extract from the okay. six minutes for for so, um uh, yeah 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 for for the listener out there or viewer who says hey I would love to do it I've got a nonfiction comic I want to do about X topic you Dan you just got through this experience you came out alive so um how do you how do you do research for something like this because I want to give you props here too. You did a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of reference gathering, and I was grateful for it because there was one moment where you said in the script, um, a collection of autopsy photos, and you didn't give me exact reference on that, so I was like, all right, I'm going to go to Google, and I'm going to naively type JFK autopsy into a Google image search, and I was sorry I did that. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you don't want to see that. How do you how do you do research on something like this? What was what was the process that you went wound up landing on? Uh, well, so the original research was a lot of reading of actual books. You know, I wanted to get in in, in addition to the Warren report. You know, the um, I wanted to get the arguments um, and see. Uh, and in many ways, kind of see what the scope of the narrative is. Hooking the narrative was really hard, and it didn't. It wasn't like I knew the structure of the book, and then I did my research. It was like the research had a lot to do with figuring out the structure of the book. 
what to give, you know, who to put on stage and, and when, and what and who either is a person or or what argument, and how many times am I going to have to cycle back to the same moment uh, so that it's clear how we can see it from different perspectives. But uh, I, I read just a lot, a lot. I was reading all the way to the end because a new book came out. Books were coming out last fall uh, because of the 50th anniversary of the assassination. And, you know, it's, it wasn't exactly new information, but but newly, newly rethought information, and yeah, you know, I, I just wanted to get a lot of perspectives, and it, it's, it's a monster of a bucket of information. It's, it's just, it's a writhing mass of this connects to this, and it's over there. It, it's crazy, um, and and pinning it down is pinning it down is really hard, <laughs> and you, you know. Figuring out, okay, what's the FBI? What's the CIA? What's the Secret Service? What's the Kennedy family? What's the what's the motivation of him, her, them, us? Uh, and you're doing that, all the, are you are you keeping detailed notes, or, or are you uh, like do do note cards, or how do you map this out? I'm keeping really bad notes. <laughs> um, I, I unfortunately my note taking was was not as good as it could have been. I mean, I I would. I would usually take notes on a legal pad, and then I couldn't always successfully transfer, or I hadn't given the page number. I had to do a lot of retreading, unfortunately. But I, uh, you know, I, I would use. Uh, there's a there is a um, a piece of software called Scrivener, mm. uh, writing software, which is uh, which is like for a novelist would use that to really be able to keep track of all sorts of different parts of what's in the book, what, who are the characters, this, that, and the other. Uh, it, it's quite nimble. Um, and it was useful for this project, too, to have my notes, transfer a bunch of my notes into Scrivener. Um, so, so that was good. Um, and, but, you know, fi sometimes finding the note that I realized needed a an addendum when I read something else wasn't as easy as I would have hoped, but I kind of got there. It, it ended up, so I was kind of sometimes working with an outline that I refurbished and refashioned, um, and it, it kind of sort of worked, and, you know, that started both with the, with the reading of, of books and articles, but then a lot of stuff online, you know, as I say in the afterward, it was very helpful to know that I could just skip any any page I found online that used the word obviously in describing something about the Kennedy assassination because I knew that that was nonsense. None of it is obvious or we would have stopped arguing about it a long time ago. So I could skip those websites. That was really a helpful helpful cue. Uh, but yeah, there, and there were some really good there were some really good websites including ones that, you know, are different, you know, take very different perspectives on the assassination. Uh, and like I said, I've come to my own conclusions about the assassination, but I got a lot of helpful information from people I didn't necessarily think were completely right in what they were seeing or what they were describing. So yeah, I, that, I did, I did kind of keep it straight. The hardest part besides my, my deficits in really keeping my notes very firm was the fact that the structure of the book was changing somewhat as I as I went along, um, that meant that something that I might say somewhere had to go somewhere else, and you know it it really was cohering all the time, which in some ways is great, you know, because it's a work in progress and it's it's not fixed in a way that locks you into doing something really wrong, but you know my joke about a lot of the work that I do is, you know. People are going to think we planned it this way, <laughs> but I'm often very far from planned it this way. Uh, but it comes together. You know, you got to have a little bit of faith in yourself uh, that it'll come together. But the yeah, the the research the research was abundant. This is the only comic I've ever done where I think I spent more time than the artist did on the project. But you know, it's, I believe you. Uh, no, yeah. I really do. Yeah, and it's um, so there was a. There was all that research. There was the structuring, finding the narrative. Look, if you're going to do, if you're going to adapt the 9/11 report, you've you've got more structure already there. Not all of it, by any means. If you're telling the life of someone or 
the story of the Alamo or whatever, you know, you find, you, you have your structure. But sometimes you have, look at uh, uh, Jim and Taviani, and I can't remember who the artist was, and I feel terrible about that, uh, uh, T-minus, which was about the, the space race, about the Russian and American uh, race to get to the moon, and the structure of the book was that he jumped around a lot in time, but every scene was identified as its distance from the launch of Apollo 11. So it might have been T minus 15 years, 8 months, 3 days, and 4 hours. But it was a great, it was a great narrative thing to, to hold it all together. Um, so, you, so yeah, you, you have to find, you have, you, and it can be close to a gimmick, that's fine, as long as you're true, truthful about it. Not truthful about the facts, truthful about your intentions to tell the best story that you can. Gimmicks are great, tools, crutches, whatever. But you need you need a narrative structure. Jersey and I are talking about a project now that is a nonfiction piece that has lots and lots of really great dramatic moments in it, but the big arc of what the story is about is kind of unclear. So we've been talking about how do you find that? How do you find the thing that when you finish the book, you know, oh, this is what it was about? Because, because you know why you need that? You really need that so that as you're working on it, you can check what you've just produced against the overall intention of the book, the overall goal, the overall theme, whatever you want to call it. If you don't know what that dramatic through line is, you don't know where you are. You don't know if you've even done a scene that's worth keeping. Uh, hmm. So you, you really, you really need to know that. So and having, having, having a sort of a mission statement for the project, right? Yeah, yeah. A, a, or you know, mission statement, or yeah, it, it's a, it's that there's a way in which that sounds a little corporate and dry to me because often they are corporate and dry. But uh, but I know what you mean. I think you want to. I, I I think you want to know where the project lives. You know that's that's a more touchy feely way of saying it. But I think it speaks to me. You want you want to know where it lives. Mm. You don't want to know the stuff. You, it's like you know, Mr. Rogers sang about it. It's you I like. It's not the things you wear. It's not the way you wear your hair. But it's you I like. Right. That's. You know, you need to find... Sorry, I raised several children. Um, the, I love Mr. Rogers. He's the best. No, I love Mr. Rogers, too. Um, oh. And I will fight anyone who makes fun of Mr. Rogers. <laughs> uh, but the idea of of finding that, you know, the the, the truth at the core... It may not be the only truth, right? It could be... Now I'm thinking of the, Superman, the first Superman movie, right? You're here for a purpose. I don't know whose purpose. I don't know what the purpose is. But it's your job, young Clark, to figure out what the purpose is. So that's your job, young writer, is you know what the story is, but you don't know what the purpose of the story is until you've really invested in it and, and kind of invested your own truth in it. Like, you know, I talked at the beginning about how I discovered that my experience of the Kennedy assassination was a much bigger part of my motivation and my writing of this book. Um, your truth and the story's truth have to intersect somewhere. And that's where the story lives, I think. Jersey, you can tell me if I'm wrong. I, that sounded really good to me. That sounded almost t-shirt worthy. Okay. Woohoo! Yeah. I, I, I won't say that it was J.M. Dematis tweet uh, material necessarily. It wasn't that far, but it was, it was in, that, in that ballpark. <laughs> well, that's oh. good, but you know... Mark DeMattis, um tweets. He, he violates my rule. I, I really believe you have to say you have to you have to do your tweet in one tweet. You can't have ellipses and more tweets to get your thought across. So that's a violation of the rules. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Uh, no, was there anything else in the on the ground section, Rob, that you wanted to address before we get to uh, closing out? Uh, no, I just uh, I just share my my reaction to that it's it's it sounds like that being immersed enough 
Um, this really does sound like it would be helpful for fictional or nonfiction yeah. um, work, but um, sounds like maybe even more is a little more is at stake with the non. Nah, I don't know. I'm let's. I'm playing fast and loose, but it sounds like there is something at stake with the 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 telling the non-fictional narrative. That uh, um, it sounds like you 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 reach a critical mass of getting to getting to the point where you had your um, where where you 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 obtain like oh this is the what you want to tell and this is um, your way you're going to go about telling it. And it seemed like like oh I that that's a contract you can live up to, and then now it's time to continue with the work, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds that sounds right. Nice. Yeah, and, and you know one of the things that I find both in fiction and in this project is that I don't necessarily know where that intersection is when I'm starting, and that's okay. You know, um, I in fact especially in fiction, I like not knowing my theme right at the beginning. Because if I know at the beginning, I might, just, I might just write the theme instead of the story. Uh, you know? So it's really helpful to, to work, struggle, you know, kind of, kind of machete your way through the jungle of the narrative of finding the pathway. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and only when you're a little... A way, a little bit of the way along it. Do you see where it's really going? You're much better off than being sure at the beginning. Again, the Warren Commission suffered from that too, being a little too sure at the beginning. I think. Well, yeah, I remember distinctly when I came on board. The one of the early plans was I was going to draw 50 pages of sequences about your reflection on the event. Like it was going to be like a, a full third. Of the, a full third of the book was going to be about that, and it wound up only really being about four or five, maybe seven pages I would, total of that. There, stuff. there was there was a there was actually a time when the question was how much of this is going to be seen through my eyes as yeah. as a real living, breathing person who experienced it, and um, you know it uh, I I got great help from our our editor Carol Burrell in coming around to. How that that ended up giving us two different books, um, yeah. and that we're not going to come together. Um, and, and instead, I was able to write about the times and the people and the experiences without personalizing it. And I think getting a lot of the same information across. It's really only the afterward that's personal. Even even that scene uh, the, about page twenty six or so that has me as a 10-year-old, um, it's only there to be emblematic of, you know, white suburban uh, baby boomer uh, life, you know, and not to be so much. It is, it is in fact, what I experienced, uh, but it's, it wasn't about that. It, it wasn't about me. Um, yeah, and can, can, I, can I just throw on like bucket list items on top of this? So a, I got to draw Dan as a kid, like my interpretation of, of Dan as a kid, and and, and though that was like an unusual sequence because I actually penciled, I did tight pencils on those pages. Yeah, uh, right. And then Ernie inked my figures, which so I got to see. Not only did I get to draw Dan as a kid, but I, I had to watch, see what it would look like when Ernie Cologne inked, uh, inked my stuff. That was the moment where I peed a little bit. Just for the record, <laughs> you know, one that of was the moment where it's like, like I, I'm getting paid for this. <laughs> one of the the kind of little, I mean, very small, but it, it's it's help. It's a it's an example of how it's helpful to keep your mind open to things you didn't expect. So I didn't wear glasses when I was ten years old. Yeah. I my mid twenties, because that's when finally somebody noticed I was squinting apparently. But. Um, Jersey, not knowing that, just drew, you know, 10-year-old Danny with glasses. And my initial reaction was, well, no, that's not me. It didn't really look all that much like, like the 10-year-old me, but that was fine. But then I said, you know, the glasses will really help keep the reader focused on the Danny character, let them know where he is and, you know, at all times on those few pages. And that was actually valuable. It was good to, to do. And you did one little panel where where the glasses are on the table because for some reason he can read better without them, uh, right? And and that was nice. So the my experience is the glasses are are for reading, but but the but that's fine. I'm sure there are 
but true that's true in, in for many people. Um, but but yeah, that's a character that was design really thing. A nice, that becomes, a nice like, it becomes a character design thing where it's like a little symbol to indicate what when you see this thing, you think of that character, right? And that that's something that right. like I think at this point I just do intuitively. I'm not really thinking that hard about it myself. It was just like, well, it's Danny's gonna have glasses, and it just worked, right? Right. And then there was one panel with the five with the five year old me, right? Yeah. There's a kindergarten scene going back to a little bit more of what our experiences were like, and having the five year old in glasses was really useful. Yeah. You know, it's just okay. There's the there's that same kid. The fact that he was talking like a sixty year old. To describe what was going on might have helped too, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Dan, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to do this. Rob, is there anything else that that uh, we wanted to layer on this before wrapping it up? No, or that was. Uh, I think that was an amazing journey, and I, I I think it really feels like we just kind of scratched the surface of of uh, of, of that project. And uh, but it but it I think there's a lot of nuggets here that. Uh, for all of us to chew on with, um, yeah. you know, just getting the, the narrative aspect. So it was that was awesome. Thank you, Dan. That's great. Thank, uh, thank you. Thank Drew, you both. Too. And you know, I guess, yeah, yeah. People will have to read the book. Apparently, people have to read the book. And if they want to hear more from Dan on this, you've got some appearances coming up, Dan, uh, related to the book. So That's September sixteenth. Right. Yeah. Right? September sixteenth. We're both going to be at Bolt of Midnight in Ann Arbor. Right. Yeah. And and a week later on the twenty third. Uh, we will be at Nicholas Books in Ann Arbor, but in between, on on uh, September 21st, I will be at the Brooklyn Book Festival doing some kind of panel that they haven't told me what it is yet. But what the heck, you know, I'll do it. Um, <laughs> then uh, uh, then on September 30th, we are going to be here in Lansing at Schuler Books, which will be cool. Uh, and at uh, then in October, we'll both be going out. And Ernie will be showing up also for the New York Comic Con. Uh, not sure exactly what our what all activities will be part of. Maybe be doing panels. We don't know. Uh, but we're um, we'll definitely be at the con. We'll be signing the books. And uh, I I understand that we're probably going to have a uh, an event at Bergen Street Comics as a kind of a launch party. Uh, Bergen Street Comics in Brooklyn on the 9th of October. Is that right? I think that's right. Uh, I think yeah. so. I think so. Yeah. So, I, like the the week of October ending around like the thirteenth, like that whole week, we we're, we're gonna be in New York City, uh, doing a whole bunch of things. So, right. um, and we, we'll make noise about it on the social medias, right? Right. Well, I'll I'll, I'll retweet whatever you say. How does that sound? <laughs> All right. Pressure's on me. The writer leaves the artist to actually come up with a concise way to describe what we're doing. The old guy leaves the leads the young guy to use social media. That's... Oh, I love that you called me young. <laughs> Makes you so happy. Yeah. But but um, the Warren Report hits stores um, September 16th, and I put together a, an easy link for everybody. It'll take you to the listing on the uh, Abrams site. And that's comicsaregreat.com slash WR for Warren Report. But um, I really recommend, if you guys want to pre-order it now, go to IndieBound.org, because then you can get it at a local bookstore. You don't have to get it through Amazon. Get it through one of the, you know, support your local bookstore by uh, doing going to the IndieBound listing, and it, there's a store finder that will show you where you can pre-order the book locally. Yeah. So uh, and, links will be in the show notes for that. Right, and by the way, it's it's simultaneous publication in hardcover and paperback. Uh, paperback with, with uh, uh, what do they call it, French something or other, not French cuffs. It's whatever, the French flaps. French flaps is what they call it, when they have something that's like a book flap going in from a paperback uh, cover. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. so that'll be, you know, this way uh, people want their permanent edition, school libraries might want more copies that they may not be circulating for as long so they could get out more cheaply by getting more paperbacks, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's nice that Abrams uh, provides those options. The gold-plated edition, I think, is not planned yet. Uh, but <laughs> well, if if the leaders out there who are watching and listening can help spread the word about it, then maybe we can get that edition printed. That's right. Uh, and pre-order, oh. definitely pre-order is a way to get buzz about the book going. Yeah, yeah, actually that is a big way to get buzz about the book going. And then go go do maybe like a, you know, a review on Goodreads or market to read on Goodreads. 
Uh, and also, I mean, don't buy it on Amazon, but review it on Amazon. That's a great way to help uh, generate interest around the book. Um, so thanks again, Dan. And Dan, if, if people can follow you at danmishkin.com, yes? They, they, can, they can follow me there. I, I don't post very frequently because, you know, I got, I've been writing this book. But uh, but they'll find anybody can be my friend at facebook.com slash Dan Michigan or they can follow me on Twitter at Dan Michigan, uh, which is usually a little more up to date. Okay. All right, and then uh, Rob, we've also got uh, the Lean Into Art Patreon feed. Where the what is it? Patreon.com slash Lean Into Art. Mm -hmm. And we've got some stuff there. We've got like the extra leans that we post, the shows we record in between the Lean Into Art shows. And you just launched a new thing called Open Mic, which is for patrons only. You have to be a patron to get in on this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, it's our solution to having uh, a little more of a forum and uh, as a way to say an extra thank you and bonus for those who support us via Patreon. And so if you, if you go there and you, you sign up as, uh, as a patron, You'll you'll see those appear in your feed, and uh, our intent is to just uh, do a new one every month, and it'll be just like you know, hey, here's the here's the conversation we had this month about different topics. We'll kick it off and uh, see see where things go, and that's it's been uh, um, it's been out for like a week or so, and there's already been a lot of great talk there. So yeah. so thank you very much for our current patrons that have uh, joined us to uh, to chat. Yeah, that's super cool. And then if you don't want to be a patron, if you're like, hey, I don't have any extra cash right now, a great way to support the show is to go to iTunes, give it a star review. You don't even have to write a review. Just however many stars you think this episode deserves. And uh, or, or if you're watching it on YouTube, giving the video a thumbs up. That helps more people find the show in the two places uh, that are most important for video and audio to be discovered. And we appreciate everybody who's given the videos the thumbs up or uh, the star reviews on iTunes. You guys are awesome for helping us out that way. And awesome just for making your voice heard. You know, vote with your vote with your thumbs ups as to what should get more attention, right? Um, so okay, well thanks everybody for downloading, listening, and watching. Thank you to Dan Michigan of DanMichigan.com and Dan Michigan every place else. Thank you, Rob, for you know the great discussion. No, no problem. I'll turn a PDF anytime, I, and I hope uh, I hope uh, Dan comes back uh, because I think there's a lot more we can talk about it when it comes to like writing, writing visually and all that. So I do think so too. Great. Love uh, you. Awesome. Cool. Thank okay. You guys. Thanks, guys. So until next time, I've been Jersey Droz of LeanIntoArt.com and Jersey on Twitter. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of LeanIntoArt.com and Rob Stenzinger on Twitter. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at LeanIntoArt.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user LeanIntoArt. And you can reach us via email at LeanIntoArt at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening. All right. I'm going to go ahead and kill the stream. Thanks, everybody, for watching and hanging out with us tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks.